that's how you do an episode, ladies and gentlemen, right there, yeah! Episode 1029 of One Piece gets it, ladies and gentlemen, alright? The way that they handled this character, absolutely phenomenal, right? This episode has the triumphant return of the greatest One Piece character ever, that's right, Mare Whoop Slap. Whoa, Whoop Slap, yeah! He's there, he's got his cane, he's got his fisherman's hat, he's got his glasses, and he's ready to wreck your day up! Okay, look, I probably shouldn't be telling you this, because it's really supposed to be kept on the down low, okay? But I, I, I just have to, okay? So obviously they plan these One Piece movies out years in advance, right? Like, they probably already decided on One Piece film Red and what the plot was going to be by the time Stampede came out, right? Because it takes years, you know, you gotta write a script, you gotta animate the whole thing, you know, it takes a long time, right? So with that being said... The next One Piece movie, the, the 16th movie, that's already been decided, okay? It's already been set in stone. I'm just going to tell you what the title is right now, okay? The 16th One Piece movie will be One Piece Film Slap. And it's going to be the last movie in the franchise. It's going to take place. It's actually going to be the moment where the Straw Hats reach Laugh Tale. They get there, and it's actually Whoop Slap. And it's going to be a whole movie. It's going to be five hours long, and it's going to be all about Whoop Slap's life, leading to him arriving at Laugh Tale before the Straw Hats and uh, having a big epic confrontation that I, I don't want to reveal anymore, okay? But, uh, yeah, Mayor Whoop Slap is back in all of his whoopness. <laughs> He's there. You think Mayor Whoop Slap has a whooper as like a Pokemon companion, that would be pretty funny. All right, um, so yeah, uh, this is uh, episode 1029, and this is a new backstory, or at least adding to the backstory with Luffy and Uta, because Uta is now included in the story. Now listen, I'll tell you this right now. Even if you don't want to consider Uta canon, because it's still sort of up in the air, I guess, um, and uh, we are actually going to talk about some film red spoilers, but that'll be much later in the video, so don't worry about it. I'll put the chapter uh, down there into the uh, little line there that YouTube has the chapter thing now. I'm also going to put it up on the screen when I start talking about film red spoilers. I have not seen the movie, but I've read spoilers of it. I know what happens in the movie, so I do want to talk about a few things that kind of tie into this episode. So if you don't want to, you know, watch that segment, that's fine. I'll let you know. Everything else will be spoiler free, okay? Just the stuff that's in the episode, okay? So, um, yeah, even if you don't want to consider Uta canon, though, this episode does a beautiful job of expanding Luffy's past in Fusha, and everything that happens could easily have been added to the canon, all right? Like, you can tell they really did their homework with this. They probably collaborated with Oda a lot to tell them, like, you know, this is the stuff you can show and the stuff that, you know, you can make sense out of, like, what Luffy was doing, because I still think in the story we're going to get the, uh, the backstory involving Luffy's birth, kind of similar to how we got, like, Naruto's in Naruto, you know, how did, you know, uh, you, you know, uh, wait, what was, Na what was Naruto's dad? Hold on, it's been a while. Minato, there we go. Minato and Kushina having Naruto and that whole, you know, backstory was explained. I still think we're going to get that with, like, Dragon and Dragon's wife and the whole story there and how did Luffy come to even arrive at Fusha Village. So that's still part of the story we don't know. But this backstory kind of takes place a little bit before even Shanks showed up because every time we see Luffy's backstory at Fusha, it's, you know, Shanks is already there. He already wants to be a pirate. He cuts his cheek and then he has the scar. This is before Luffy has the scar. This is before, this is actually Luffy first meeting Shanks, which is a big deal. And there's a lot of other stuff, little Easter eggs tucked around in this entire episode. So we're going to go into it today. All right. So uh, this is, of course, a movie tie in. This episode and the next episode will be movie tie ins for Film Red, um, and which is out in Japan right now. There is a release schedule. Artur had one. I'll just put it up here. You know, go check out his Twitter for more details and his website, Library of O'Hara. But so far, this is the current uh, shakedown of release schedules for Film Red. Uh, I think it's just coming out, like, generically in the fall of this year in the uh, in the United States. So I don't know exactly when I'm going to get to go see it, but as soon as it's available, I will go watch it. Okay, so the episode starts out on the Thousand Sunny. The Straw Hats, including Jinbei, we see Jinbei chilling out on the Thousand Sunny, just taking a nap. So that was pretty cool to see. And uh, Usopp is just kind of working on his Kabuto as he has a tone dial next to him playing one of Uta's songs. And this is the song New Genesis, which if you've 
you've been reading the manga lately, you see like the origin of that song in one of those uh, those prelude chapters that Oda released. Okay, so uh, New Genesis is playing on the tone dial or the TD. I like to think, and this is the same deal with uh, Brooke, and it makes sense that like at some point. I guess uh, the Blue Sea Dwellers or maybe Vegapunk or somebody found the tone dials falling from the sky and they were able to study the technology and replicate it, okay? Because now there's tone dials everywhere, right? That was one of the things that I was always a little confused by, like after the two-year time skip, you know, like, oh, Brooks Soul King TDs are selling off the charts. I'm like, where are they getting all of these tone dials from? Like, I understand a few of them might fall from the sky and some people might bring them back, but they're like everywhere. There's as, there's common places like CDs in our world, right? Where like, I guess CDs used to be in our world, right? So uh, I like to think that, yeah, Vega punk got his hands on a tone dial at some point figured out a way to mass produce them and now they're everywhere and it makes sense that it would not just be brook i mean yeah brook is just the soul king he is one genre of music but there would be other genres of music you know like j-pop and that's what we have here with uta okay so um you know usopp's just working on his kabuto and everybody's just chilling out on the sunny you know zoro's training you know and we have frankie there working on some stuff and then you just have uta's song playing and luffy's just kind of chilling off to the side you know kind of like looking out at the ocean and kind of like you know the song is making him reminisce of something okay and so Jean Bay's like you know oh what's that song I've never heard of it and Usopp's like this is a hugely popular song Jean Bay and then we cut to a flashback of Luffy's past growing up in the Goa kingdom uh, but this is before he met Ace before he met Dadan before he met Sabo before he met Shanks this is like literally Luffy at level one <laughs> in fact in D&D terms it's, it sort of is like that it's like level one one Luffy as an adventurer, he gets into a fight with a monkey. So it's just like, yeah, you're out there uh, collecting fruit outside of town, and this monkey just walks up to you, and it's just like, all right, roll initiative, let's go. So uh, yeah, Luffy bumps into Whoop Slap, and also a uh, a food cart, like a fruit cart, like falls apart. But the townsfolk are very nice to Luffy. The the, the uh, guy selling the fruit is like, here you go, Luffy, you look a little hungry. And Whoop Slap is just like, ah, you kids, you know, you know, just running around the town. Damn it, you know, one of these days, one of these days, Whoop Slap's gonna show you what for. I ate a Logia years ago, and I repressed my power. You know, like, Whoop Slap takes off his Hawaiian shirt. He has a bunch of, like, you know, restrictive, like, you know, binds on him or something, like the hundred seals or some shit. And he's like, I will release these seals! And he grows to, like, ten times his size, you know, and he's just like, I will rule the world someday, but not today, not today. Okay. So we see a scene with Luffy going out into the woods outside of Fusha, and yeah, he gets into a fight with a monkey. The monkey's like, I want the fruit, and Luffy's like, well, if you spar with me, I'll give you the fruit. So they fight, and Luffy wins. Now, the only other thing we know about Luffy's past at this point, because Luffy, he was seven years old when he first meets Shanks. Um, there's a little bit of a time skip later on in the episode, so I like to think Luffy's six years old at the beginning of this episode, okay? Now, at this point, we, don't, we do know a little bit about him we know that garp has been raising him to be a marine and we actually do see garp in this episode in his younger years we know that at this point luffy has just been put through trial after trial through garp like garp like threw him into a jungle once for like a month or something to survive on his own so luffy even though he doesn't have a devil fruit at this point and he hasn't been training with uh, ace or sabo or anybody luffy can still you know even at level one he could still you know handle himself okay he fights against a damn like chimpanzee and he wins. Did you ever see those things? The chimpanzees? Those things will like wreck your shit. Like seriously, okay? Luffy wins, alright? So he beats the crap out of the monkey, but he's a nice guy so he's like, hey, I'll let you uh, have half of the fruit. So the monkey and Luffy are just chilling out, eating the fruit. And that's a fun little scene. Uh, then we see a scene where he's being chased by a wild boar. Luffy jumps off a cliff, lands in the water. Now once again, he doesn't have a devil fruit, so he should be able to swim, except anybody that remembers the manga canon of one Piece should know, Luffy has never been stated to be able to swim well, even before he had the devil fruit, which is understandable because he's a little kid. I remember I didn't know how to swim until I was like, I, I didn't know how to swim well until I was like in middle school, like seriously. But anyway, yeah, so he falls into the water and he's sinking and he can't swim. Garp grabs him, fishes him out, throws him on a rock, and he's like, you still sink like a bag of hammers in the water. So even though Luffy ate a devil fruit later and he can't swim now, it's not like he had swimming power anyway. Like, it's not like with Buggy. 
Buggy was always established to be able to swim really well, and then he ate the Bara Bara no Mi, and that sort of took that, uh, that, that skill away from him because he now can't swim anymore because he's a Devil Fruit user, right? With Luffy, it's sort of like, eh, he wasn't really able, he wasn't good at swimming anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So, interesting scene here with Garp, and we only have the one scene with it, but I do want to bring it up because it is kind of interesting. This is what I mean by little Easter eggs in the background, all right? So, uh, he fishes Luffy out of the water, and he's just like, you need to learn how to swim if you're going to be in the Navy someday. And Luffy's like, eh, I don't want to be in the Navy. I don't want to be a Marine. And Garp looks at him and says, you have to become the strongest Marine soldier there is. Interesting that Garp would phrase it like that. That's what I mean about this episode, all right? So that honestly got me thinking that, like, what if, like, Garp is, like, aware of, like, well, he already is aware of, like, rocks, but rocks should be, like, dead at this point, or, like, gone. So what if it's a thing where, like, Garp is remembering all the dangerous, you know, people he's fought before, and this is long after Roger has died as well in the Great Pirate Era. So I guess you could look at it in just a generic sense of, like, the Great Pirate Era is happening, and there's a lot of really uh, strong pirates that are causing problems in the world. So Garp is looking to his grandson and being like, you need to get really strong and you need to be the greatest marine ever to deal with those pirates. Sure, you could look at it like that in just a more broad sense, but you could also look at it like maybe Garp is like, you know, if rocks ever return someday, I might not be able to deal with him, so you gotta get strong, you know, the next generation. That's the way I interpreted it, maybe, who knows. Um, Luffy at this point also says he doesn't say he wants to be a pirate because he doesn't want to be a pirate yet. And that's actually going to be clear in the next scene when he first meets Shanks. But Luffy says, I don't want to be a Marine. I want to live more freer than that, okay? And Garp is just like, Grr! you know, he's like, I'm going to hit you, you know, just like, yeah. So the idea is Luffy doesn't want to be a Marine, but he doesn't want to be a pirate. He doesn't know what he wants to be yet. He just knows inherently he wants to have, he, he wants to do something where he He's the most free in the world, and he gets to see the world in just a very, very fundamental sense. And that makes sense because he has the will of D, and it was always mentioned that those that bear the will of D always vie for that sense of freedom in the world. So even before Luffy really understood what it meant to be a pirate, he still wanted to have freedom. And the Marines, just the idea of joining like a military organization that has this hierarchy and very structured and like, you know, tries to kind of remove individuality to the point of just like, you know, you will be a soldier, you will fight. You know, that just, that idea is just, you know, like the furthest from what Luffy wants, even at this young age. Okay, so that was a very interesting scene with Garp and Luffy. So the next scene we have is the introduction of Uta, okay? We see the Red Force sailing. Uh, they had just captured a bunch of treasures, so we see a bunch of gold and jewelry. Uh, Uta's there at age nine. Shanks is there at age 27. Uh, she is established as the musician of the Red Hair Pirates. This will be important later. Um, and there's a scene where we actually see Shanks opening up the chest that contains the Gamu Gamu no Mi, or the, you know, Hito Hito no Mi, <coughs> model mythical zone, <coughs> sun god Nika. <clears throat> Sorry, really big, just, you know, I have a cough there. Oh, by the way, this is a One Piece film red shirt that I got at Anime Expo. I'm actually wearing it backwards, though, uh, because Steve Aoki was there, and he's, like, a really popular DJ, and the front of it looks really cool, but the back actually has the film red logo, so that's why, in case you were curious, in case somebody was just, like, teching, are you wearing that shirt backwards? I am, but on purpose. Film Red. Okay. So anyway, um, this is probably what I'm going to wear when I actually go see Film Red as well. So anyway, um, yes. So, uh, Shanks looks in the chest, he sees the devil fruit, Uta kind of looks at it, like, ooh, what's that, Shanks? And Shanks is like, oh, uh, no nothing, yeah. Is that for me? Oh, no, no, it's not, it's just something unrelated. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, Shanks is like, alright, I have this devil fruit, hmm, I wonder if that's going to be relevant at all. Interesting. They mention that they're going to be docking at, on a, uh, the outskirts of the Goa Kingdom at Fusha Village, or Windmill Village, alright? And Uta's not very excited about all that, she looks at it basically like, wow, it looks very boring, is basically her reaction. And uh, Shanks is like, you know, we could, we could do with a little bit of that, especially since after everything that happened. So, interesting points here. Uh, it was mentioned that the CP9 that, you know, Shanks got the Gamu Gamu no Mi from did not have regular treasure, and there's like a bunch of treasure like on board the ship. I suppose it's always possible that Shanks could have gotten the treasure from another ship after CP9. Like, they attacked Cypherpool, they got the Gamu Gamu no Mi, and then there was like another ship they attacked, and that got like regular 
regular treasure, and now they're kind of laying low. In fact, that might actually be the reason why Shanks spent a whole year docked at Fuchsia Village. Now that I think about it, he just stole a devil fruit from the damn government that they were closely guarding with their strongest cipher pull agency. Shanks at this point might be like, I think we should probably lay low for a little while before we go back to the Grand Line or something, you know? Um, something else is we actually get the reveal of, of Shanks' bounty when he was 27 years old, so before he became a Yonko, okay? This was something that, it. this is actually canon. This is not something they just threw into the anime like they just threw a number at us just for the sake of throwing a number at us, okay? There was, I believe, a pamphlet released in One Piece Film Red, and the pamphlet doesn't really spoil anything about the movie, but it says, like, you know, some, like, fun facts about some characters that we didn't know that Oda provided, and one of those facts was uh, Shanks' bounty before he became a Yonko. So it is canon, and it is one billion forty million. All right, that was his bounty, all right? So you have to look at it from the perspective of, like, okay, this is before he's a Yonko. He probably made a few trips to the Grand Line, but now he's just docking at, Fu at Fusha just to kind of lay low. Um, and he's 27, he has a bounty of 1 billion 40 million. So Luffy, at age 19 in the present storyline, already has a bounty of 3 billion and is an emperor. So he's, he's making progress way faster than Shanks. You know, very interesting to look at that there. Okay. So um, anyway, yeah, they dock at the village. Luffy meets them. He sees the Red Force in all of his splendor. And Luffy's first reaction is not like, oh, you're pirates, take me with you. No, Luffy's first reaction is like, are you pirates? And Uta jumps out, and Uta's like, yeah, we are. What you gonna do about it, huh? And Luffy's just like, you better not cause any problems for the townsfolk around here. I'm gonna fight you. And then Shanks gets out, and he's like, ah, oh, I didn't know that this town had such an adamant sheriff working here. You know, so he's being funny. But um, it just goes to show, once again, Luffy was taught his entire life that, like, okay, pirates are bad people. They're gonna come to islands and, like, burn things down and, like, murder everybody, right? That's the way that Garp has been raising him. Now, we also get a little bit of a flash forward here, like a couple of months. Luffy still doesn't have the scar, which he gave as like a test of his metal. He doesn't have that yet. So it's probably only like a month or two with Shanks being docked there. Remember, they stayed for a full year before the whole event with, you know, Luffy getting the straw hat and then Lord of the Coast and Higuma, okay? So um, at, at any rate, so um, at this moment, though, when Luffy first sees Shanks, he's like, I don't want to be a pirate right away. He's like, pirates are bad people. You know, they might come into the island and attack everybody and Whoop Slap might have to release his second seal, and if he releases his second out of 100 seals, the entire island could be destroyed! You know, we can't have that, right? So, Luffy at the very beginning, it's it's interesting to see his character like that. Now, after spending a few, uh, you know, weeks or months with Shanks and the crew, he learns about what it's like to be a real pirate, okay? And Shanks is probably the best person that could set an example, okay? Because Shanks, I mean, he can definitely kill you, but he doesn't have, like, the let's just go to these towns and burn them down kind of mentality, you know what I mean? So, uh, we see that. But it's interesting to see Luffy's, you know, first perspective of pirates meeting Shanks for the very first moment. And that's, like, what I mean, like... Yeah, it, it might not be canon 100%, but I feel like Oda had a hand in writing the script for this episode a little bit, or at least giving some notes on, like, because this is, like, Shanks meeting, I mean, Luffy meeting Shanks for the first time. I feel like Oda should be involved in, like, how he would respond to this. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Okay. It's just not the way Garp raised him, okay? So... Um, now we cut to, like I said, a few weeks later, a few months later or whatever. They're in the bar. Lucky Roo and Bonk Punch, two members of the Red Hair crew, are just, like, beating the shit out of each other. And Luffy's like, wow, I can't wait to be a pirate, Shanks. And Shanks is just like, oh, my God, would you quit bugging me with that every day? You know, being a pirate isn't so glamorous, Luffy, right? So Uta's there, and she announces herself as the musician of the Red Hair Pirates. And they talk about how important it is to have have a musician on the crew, and then she sings a song. She sings Where the Wind Blows, okay? And it's this really cute moment where everybody kind of clears room in Party's bar and Makino's bar, and they get, like, a table, and then Lucky Roo and Ben Beckman lift Uta on the table. Yasop takes, like, a handkerchief, and she lands on the handkerchief very elegantly, and she's like, I'm a diva. And then so she sings this song, and it's a very great song. The songs in this episode do a phenomenal job of, like, conveying emotion and stuff. Keep in mind... And this is something, this is not a spoiler for the movie, okay? Film Red, I think, is primarily a musical, okay? And I only bring that up because a few people have been like, you know, uh, they weren't expecting that many songs in the movie or songs to be a main focus. 
like as soon as the basic premise of Film Red was explained to me and they were getting Ado and all of these popular Japanese bands to play in the movie, I pretty much realized right away this is basically going to be a one piece kind of musical movie kind of extravaganza, okay? So if you didn't know that already or if you think going into this movie it's going to be all about like like there's going to be one or two songs and that's it. Like no, this is this is a musical event, all right? Which works great for me because I don't know about you, but I've been on a huge musical kick for the last few months. I watched Les Miserables uh, recently. I watched Sweeney Todd last night, which by the way, I actually have the soundtrack of it queued up over here. Okay, that's enough, that's enough, that's enough. <laughs> One more line, we have to pay for the song. I don't even, that might even get content ID'd. I don't know. I'll have to cut that out if it does. But uh, yeah, so I, I'm on this big musical kick right now. So the idea of watching Film Red as a musical, I'm actually really excited for that. And this episode is kind of a prelude to that, all right? So, Uta sings, or it's Ado, who's the, the voice of Uta while she's singing, sings Where the Wind Blows. It's a very emotional song. Everybody in the bar is just kind of like, you know, awestruck by this. All of the members of the Red Hair crew are listening. Luffy's listening. Now, after the song is over, uh, Luffy's like, yeah, well, um, I can sing too. In the east blue, where the wind always blows. And, like, Uta comes, like, out of the bar screaming and, like, crying. <laughs> Listening to a song like that will make the red-haired pirate's IQ drop. And so that was pretty funny. That was pretty cute there. Um, so this is important, though, in the story, in the canon, in Luffy's, like, what he learned when, like, Shanks and his crew were there. Because remember after Luffy leaves to go start the Straw Hats, Remember the one role he wanted to fill in the crew as fast as possible? It was a musician. It was a running gag throughout One Piece for the longest time, a lot of times in the East, where every time they would go to a new island, Luffy's like, I need to find a musician. I need to find a musician. I need to find a musician, right? And so they're like, no, Luffy, we need a navigator first. We need a cook first. We need someone that can fight. You know, we don't need a musician right now, okay? This episode explains why like that Luffy got that in his head at such a young age of like a musician a musician is what's important to being a pirate because of Uta because she could sing so beautifully and the red-haired pirates mentioned that you need to have a musician because pirates and music go hand in hand I'm also going to bring this up now what if the reason for it is because music, specifically Bink Sake, might actually have a major role to play when it comes to the reveal of the Void Century and the One Piece and the Will of D and this big plot. This has been mentioned before by other people on YouTube and things. You know, I'm not the first person to say this, but like music plays a very integral role. The lyrics of Bink Sake are very important and musicians in general are very important. So no shit, this movie all being about music, I think, is going somewhere with this, okay? Pay attention to the music! And Brooke is the single most important character in the entire story behind Whoop Slap. We've already established this, okay. So after this, Luffy plays a little bit of like a guessing game with Shanks because he keeps bugging Shanks. Like, I want to be a pirate. I want to be a pirate. Take me on your ship and everything. This, I feel, is the lead up to Luffy causing himself to get the scar where Luffy, like for months and months, keeps bugging Shanks to be a pirate. And Shanks is like giving him these little challenges and stuff. And if you can do this, then you can be a pirate. But Luffy fails every time. And so Luffy finally has enough one day and he just takes the knife and he gives himself the scar under the eye as an act of bravery. Like, I'll show you I could be a real pirate. And he gives himself the scar. And Shanks is like, Luffy's a real pirate now, you know. He still doesn't take him on the ship. But, like, this is the beginning of that. Where it's at the beginning, it just was like Luffy playing, like, some games with Shanks. And Shanks is just like, ah, you can't be a pirate. So he plays that carnival game where it's like he takes a coin and hides it under a, a cup. Actually, we can play it right now. Did you see the cups back here? Did you see I had the cups back here? It's almost like this was planned or something. I don't know. Okay, everyone, pay attention to this marvelous and amazing D20 that I have here in my hands. Nothing up my sleeves, nothing behind my back. Okay, here we go. Do, 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 Which one's it under? Find out at the end of the episode. Okay, back to it. Okay, back to it. All right. 
So um, there's a scene there, though. Luffy guesses wrong, unfortunately, and uh, Shanks actually hid the coin in his mouth. So he's like, it was a joke all along. It was just like, you had no chance, right? And so Luffy's like, darn, whatever. So uh, at this point, Shanks is, I think, a little bit of annoyed with having Luffy around. And so he's just like, hey, uh, Luffy, why don't you go take Uta and show her around the island? You know, let the let the grown-ups drink <laughs> in peace or whatever. So, you know, like you're the same age, right? So you should get along with them. And uh, Uta's like, I'm not the same age i'm nine luffy seven and just like okay whatever just you know, go out and play we're drinking grog you know it's like whatever okay so this is a really nice scene uh, that leads into the end of the episode where uh luffy is taking uta around uh the island and they climb up on a cliff and they both climb up together so uta does have some capabilities like she's been on the red hair you know pirate crew you know she can actually like not i don't know if she could fight like you know really powerful opponents or whatever i don't know if she could take on the chimpanzee like luffy could but they run up the this um this this cliff and they like race to the top and they get there at like the same time uh they have a bunch of other competitions like a height competition and a cuteness competition and an arm wrestling competition but i think luffy wins that one but she just like lies and says i won you know what i mean so it's it's a nice little scene there and the end of the episode is beautiful it's uh, Luffy taking Uta into one of the giant windmills in Fusha, which is funny because Fusha Village has, you know, we've seen it so many times in the story before. This is the first time we're actually utilizing the giant windmills that are covering the island. The whole point of the village is Windmill Village. This is the first time Luffy's actually going into a windmill, okay? So, he takes Uta into this windmill. They go up to the top level. These windmills are huge. They're like five, six, seven stories tall, like these giant stone windmills. And so, he opens up a window, and and they look out over Fusha as the sun is setting. And the sun's setting over the windmills. And they're so they're so cool to look at from this one scene. I'll, like, throw it up there for you. And they both kind of admit their dreams. You know, Luffy wants to go out to sea and be king of the pirates or be a pirate. Like, I want to be a pirate and go out to sea someday, right? And Uta's like, yeah, I want to have my dream too and everything. And um, there's another scene that does tie into the movie. So this is going to be the end of the episode. And then we're going to move on to, like, the spoilers in the movie kind of thing, okay? So, um... Uta, she talks about how, you know, she's traveled all over the place with the Red Hair crew. She's seen a lot of different islands, a lot of different places. Uh, but the most magical place is uh, the place, like, inside your own imagination, okay? And Luffy doesn't really understand what she means. Pause. That will be important for the movie, okay? So there's that nice scene there. And then the episode just kind of ends with them staring out over the sunset uh, from the windmill. Okay, and then there's going to be another episode next week that's also going to be a tie-in with the movie continuing the story. Something might happen there. I guess we'll see. Okay, but it was a really good episode, really solid episode. The animation was great. The, the, the songs in the episode were phenomenal, and I've said phenomenal a lot, but it's a great word to use. And uh, yeah, so I think this is like shaping up to be a really good movie tie-in, little little filler arc, and then adding it. Maybe not might not be a filler, though. It might actually be canon to the story. Who knows? I guess we'll find out. I mean, like, you know, there was a lot of stuff about Strong World when that came out. Like, is Shiki canon? And then it turned out he is canon. Probably not everything in the movie about Shiki was canon, but the character still is. So even if Oda wants to rework some stuff involving Uta, Uta can still exist as a canon character in the story. I think it fits really okay. So anyway, though, that was the end of the episode. Now we are going to be moving into spoilers about Film Red territory. Spoilers! 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 Go upstairs and check in your fridge if you have any milk and uh, check the expiration date on that milk and find out if that milk is spoiled because you want to get rid of it if it is. Okay, anyway, so um, this is just me going through some stuff that I've read about Film Red in the last few days uh, about the movie, okay? So when Uta in this episode talks about how um, the most uh, magical world there is, the most amazing place I've ever been is like, inside of my own mind, inside of my own imagination, that's actually referring to her devil fruit ability. So Uta in the film, not in this flashback, but in the film, has a devil fruit and it is the Uta Uta no me. Uta just meaning song in Japanese, okay? So her name is literally just song, okay? So it's the song song fruit, not to be confused with Apu's devil fruit, which is the Oto Oto no me, which is the sound sound fruit, all right? So Apu's is all about uh, just actual sound, like creating sounds through instruments and attacking using the vibrations of the sounds, okay? Um, Uta's is a little bit more esoteric. It's a little bit more... Um, she sings songs and she sends people into a dream world, all of her own imagination. 
that's what the devil fruit does. From what I understand about the movie, it's very powerful. Um, it basically allows her to suck everybody in that hears the song into a pocket dimension space called, like, Uta World or whatever. And it's basically she is god of this dimension and she can kind of do whatever she wants uh, with the people inside of that dimension, okay? So it also leads to an interesting parallel because a big thing about Film Red, spoilers remember, is that... Um, how is this movie going to be handled because Shanks is there, but the Straw Hats are there, but if Luffy meets Shanks in the movie, you know, that's like a thing that should be in the manga, right? Like, that's a big event. So I believe, and I haven't seen the movie, I've just read stuff, but I think the way they handle it is that Luffy and the Straw Hats get sucked into this, uh, like, this pseudo space, this pocket dimension that Uta creates with her devil fruit, and then the red hair pirates are in the real world and so we kind of cut back and forth we see the straw hats uh in the dream world and then we see shanks in the real world kind of like working together but not really and then like the final scene of the movie is like luffy goes to attack and then shanks goes to attack they're not right next to each other but they're doing it at the same time so it's like you know it's like symbolic or whatever you know what i mean uh, I think there's also, like, a scene in the movie where Usopp is, like, collaborating in the dream world, like, trying to come up with a plan at the same time that his father, Yasop, is in the outside world trying to come up with a plan as well. So it's like they're working together, but they don't know they're working together, I guess, and it's, like, in different dimensions. So it's, like, across dimensions they're working together, you know, and, like, in a dream world and in the physical world, okay? That's the way I interpret it. Uh, Uta ends up being, I guess, the main antagonist of this movie, um, and there's some other stuff involving her that I'm not really 100% sure of just from reading the spoilers, but I assume that, like, you know, she wants to see Shanks or something, or, or maybe she's, like, resentful, and, like, she builds up all of this, like, negative emotions, and she's just, like, repressed it her entire life, and then it comes out as, like, a monster in, like, this demon realm, or, like, this dream realm, or a demon world, or whatever she creates. I imagine it's something like that. Um, this is, like, the most, this is the most scattershotted, abridged version of a movie. This isn't, like, I've never seen the movie, it's just, I read a few things that some people posted, so we're just talking about that now. So, that's the movie, anyway. But anyway, I really like this episode, and I like the backstory with Uta and all that. So, uh, yeah, we'll see where this goes, and I can't wait to see him film read in theaters. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's the video. That's the video there. Um, uh, we're done with spoilers. I'll just, like, add another cut at the end. Done with spoilers. We're good. Um, there's not gonna be any Komodo Dragon facts today. However, we can go back to that game and see who won. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the big finale. Finale? Finale of the cup game. All right. So, we're gonna go with cup number one, cup number two, and cup number three. If you guessed cup number one, congratulations! You win nothing! Okay. Now, cup number two. All right, I'm sorry you didn't win. I'm just kidding that, you know, you lost. You still lost. Sorry. Okay. And now, of course, cup number three. Yep, you win. So, anybody that picked cup number three, congratulations. Uh, you win a pie. All right, so, but you have to do some work to get the pie. What you have to do is you have to go out and you have to buy a pie tin and uh, some pie crust and you have to bring it back to your house and you also have to buy some pie filling and then you have to like take the pie crust put it in the pie tin take out the pie filling fill it in to the pie crust then you're gonna look online to see what kind of pie you got like if it was a pumpkin pie or a cherry pie or a chocolate pie or whatever and then you're gonna need an oven for this as well and so you're gonna need to preheat that oven you're gonna need to stick the pie into the oven and cook it for you know however long it recommends when I make pecan pies it's usually like 45 minutes or some such so they stick it in the oven for however long you know, and then um, take out the pie. Be careful. It's very hot and you're going to set it down to cool. You want to make that, make sure that pie cools. And then after about maybe a half an hour, then you can enjoy the pie. So there you go. Congratulations. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks for watching. This will be Teching signing out. Later, everyone.